I'm Sarah Jo Hamilton. I'm here tonight in my capacity as former, and I emphasize former, um, first deputy chief counsel for the disciplinary committee in the first department. Um, and I was there for a number of years and saw, you know, complaints come in and complaints go out. But I think one of the things that, that was brought out in our uh, discussions, especially with Maddie before this panel, uh, took place was that nobody has any idea how a disciplinary committee functions. And I think that to um, illuminate some of the issues that have been brought up tonight, it, it's probably a good idea to let you know w how a complaint comes into a disciplinary or grievance committee and what happens to it after that. And so I will try without boring you to tears because it's entirely a procedural you know, morass. Uh, I'll just start with saying that in all four departments, the procedures are different. Every single judicial department has its own way of doing attorney discipline. And while there are many, many, many similarities, especially with respect to public discipline, um, which is censure, suspension, disbarment, um, the procedures regarding private discipline or lesser forms of discipline or cautions are wildly different among all four departments. Now, I know um, about all of them, but of course I am most familiar with the first department, and I will try to give you a little idea of how it happens in the first and then refer to differences uh, in the others if, you know, if, if that's relevant. Um, essentially, and this is true for all, uh, most, most attorney discipline starts with a complaint. Usually it's a complaint from a client, but we don't have to deal with that. Um, the complaints against prosecutors come in through um, defendants complaining, judges referring a case to the disciplinary committee, and for the most part, when an appellate division decision criticizes or reverses uh, uh, reverses a, 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 a conviction based on prosecutorial misconduct, um, and that is either referred by the appellate division by, by dint of sending the decision to the chief counsel in the department, um, or it's picked up in the law journal, which is where many of those cases actually get picked up. The grievance committees and disciplinary committees do scrutinize the law journal. They pick up on contempt. They pick up on, uh, on uh, prosecutorial misconduct in that way. And, and then an investigation is opened. In all the departments, there is sua sponte investigation authority and that doesn't require a complaint or referral from a judge. Um, obviously, if there is a referral from the judge, uh, that's taken and, and opened the same way that, that any other investigation would be opened, with perhaps a bit more deference to the, to the author. Um, anyway, um, in, in situations like, like this, where there is an, any, a, a, a potential uh, case of misconduct can come in, in a number of ways, uh, it's, it's my experience that no one in the grievance and disciplinary committees is assigned specific authority to root out prosecutorial misconduct cases or complaints. No one in, 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 that I'm aware of in any of the departments is, is the prosecutor of prosecutors. Um, so those cases come in and they are usually assigned the way any other complaint would be assigned depending on caseload, depending on expertise, expend, uh, depending upon um, other, other factors in the way that, that cases are handed out in, in a committee. Um, so a case is opened and quote unquote investigated. For the most part, in cases of prosecutorial misconduct, where it is a defendant alleging that the prosecutor conspired with his attorney to convict him. Um, most of those cases uh, actually do not go any further. There is no evidence presented. Uh, there has to be a colorable claim in a complaint, um, some allegation, some basis in fact to open a complaint. You, you, we can't just get an unhappy defendant's letter saying the prosecutor was in cahoots with my attorney and you know, I'm, I, they, they violated my civil rights. That in and of itself will never be the basis for a complaint opening. However, if there's a statement of fact that, that could lead one to believe that if true, that this could constitute misconduct, then that complaint would be investigated in the same way that any other client complaint or complaint from another individual about an attorney's misconduct. 
um, would be treated. The other way that we get that, that the committees get complaints, of course, is by judicial referral. Um, and in terms of prosecutorial misconduct, we ha the disciplinary committees will receive a, st a letter from a judge in closing a decision, or if they've gotten the decision out of the law journal, an investigation is opened and the complaint is sent to the, uh, to the um, respondent, and the respondent prosecutor is asked to answer the complaint. And I know that there have been cases opened against prosecutors in this way, where a prosecutor has answered the complaint, often defended by another attorney, uh, probably an administrator in the district attorney's office. And the complaints are answered, and then they are internally dealt with in the same way that any other complaint would, would be. And this is a perfect example. I have a case here. I just you know pulled it out. This is a, a 2005 decision of public discipline. And I'll, you know, I'll go into what constitutes public discipline in a bit. But um, the, what happened in this particular case, which uh, involved a prosecutor who told lies to the court about his uh, contact with a witness um, and um, a, a basically a, a Brady violation. In this case, this particular respondent had been issued a letter of caution for a prior violation for prosecutorial misconduct. Now, the case doesn't tell me what that prior um, violation was, but it's a very good indicator of what happens when there is a finding of prosecutorial misconduct which does not rise to the level that His Honor was talking about, where there has been an intentional um, a violation of, of, of Brady or, or intentional Rosaria violation, which results in a reversal, or any other ethical violation, which Ellen has outlined, um, which a which, uh, prosecutor has, has a duty to, uh, to comply with the rules of um, professional conduct. Anyway, uh, in this case, there was a letter of caution. That's private discipline. That's private discipline just about everywhere in the state, even though the, the standards for a, quote, a letter of caution differ among the four departments. But what that indicates to me, without obviously since private discipline is private, um, that indicates to me that this particular respondent had committed a violation which was not found to be um, necessarily a grave intentional infraction of, of an ethical precept, but was perhaps a judgment call that was wrong, and, he, and, and this particular respondent was called, called out for it or criticized in an opinion, something like that. That's what happens to most of the cases in, in, in the disciplinary arena. They are very often judgment, judgment calls on the part of the prosecutor in, in which the prosecutor is wrong, and the ones that get reported anyway, are not always so clear-cut as an absolute intentional violation. And when they are, the courts respond by disciplining if, with public discipline, either censuring, suspending, or disbarring this particular respondent in this case. And there are several others that, that are public. Um, this particular respondent was uh, suspended from the practice of law for a period of time. All right. Uh, first, I'd like to thank Maddie Delone and the Innocence Project for inviting me to be part of this uh, panel on this troubling issue. My part is to give the prosecution perspective, and I do so as a former prosecutor of 23 years' experience and as a current criminal court judge for almost five years. I started in the Bronx DA's office under Mario Marola uh, and uh, continued as an assistant under Robert Johnson. Uh, I left that office in 2007 when I was appointed to the bench as chief of the Child Abuse and Sex Crimes Bureau. Uh, and uh, since I've been appointed to the bench, I've sat in both New York County and Queens County uh, as a judge in criminal court. And right now, I sit uh, in a combined all-purpose and felony waiver part, so I don't have the extensive trial experience uh, of Judge Buchter um, to inform my, uh, my uh, perspective on this, but uh, I have done uh, some misdemeanor trials, and obviously I handle hundreds of cases 
uh, a day uh, on the calendar. I want to say first that my views on this subject are my own views. They are colored uh, by my present experience as a judge and informed by my past experience as a prosecutor. But I do not, uh, nor would I ever, purport to speak on behalf of my former office or any other district attorney's office. That being said, I do not think there would be any disagreement from any district attorney's office that the willful suppression of material exculpatory evidence by a prosecutor, such as that which occurred in Mr. Thompson's case, is morally and ethically reprehensible and should be severely sanctioned. That sanction, in my opinion, should include both external discipline by the bar and internal discipline by the district attorney. I do believe, however, that there is a broad spectrum of what can be termed prosecutorial misconduct. And while I do not condone any prosecutorial misconduct, not all of it deserves or requires such a harsh response. In my view, there is a substantive and significant difference between the misconduct which occurs in court in the heat of the adversarial process of a trial and the type of misconduct which occurred in Mr. Thompson's case. Improper argument or questioning is simply not the same as intentionally withholding exculpatory evidence or intentionally failing to investigate evidence which could exculpate the defendant. The latter two are done for the purpose of skewing a trial to assure the conviction of the defendant. Since only the prosecutor knows what he has not told or done, there can be no cure during the trial for his actions, and the trial cannot ever be fair to the defendant. To the contrary, improper argument or questioning can be cured by the judge, whose role it is to ensure that the trial is fair, with or even without objection by counsel. Indeed, as we know from appeals which have been taken on these grounds, the defendant's right to a fair trial is often not impacted by such error, which is deemed harmless in the context of the entire trial. Moreover, improper argument or questioning by one side is often responsive to perceived improper argument or questioning by the other side. That doesn't justify it when committed by a prosecutor who is held to a higher standard of conduct as a government official but it does explain or mitigate it in some instances. Thus, in my opinion, the appropriateness of a sanction for such less egregious conduct is best left to the district attorney to determine. That does not preclude and should, in fact, include for repeat bad faith offenders a referral by the district attorney to the bar for discipline and, where appropriate, sanctions by the bar uh, which are public. A prosecutor's role is to seek justice, not convictions. When I was a prosecutor, I strove to adhere to this role, but it is very easy to get caught up in the game and in wanting to win. Many mistakes are made when prosecutors put wanting to win first. Also, doing justice does not equal a rush to judgment. Mistakes are also made when investigations are begun with a focus on a particular individual or result. Stubborn belief in the rightness of a particular conclusion blinds you to other possibilities. You either can't see them or you deliberately ignore them. To serve justice as a prosecutor, in my opinion, you must remain detached. To assist prosecutors in best achieving this end and to internally monitor their compliance, I believe that district attorneys should establish and implement clear policies defining appropriate and inappropriate conduct and describing the potential consequences of misconduct, including internal and external disciplinary measures. Where appropriate, child ju trial judges should alert the district attorney when they perceive that prosecutorial misconduct has occurred so that the district attorney may respond. I realize as a former prosecutor that establishing a policy, especially in writing of this nature, may be an anathema. How could it or will it be used against the district attorney to subvert or divert the real issues at a trial? And my response to that is that the judge controls the admission of relevant evidence and the exclusion of ir irrelevant evidence at a trial. In my opinion, the benefits of having such a policy, serving the ends of justice by ensuring righteous convictions of the guilty and exoneration of the innocent, far outweigh the disadvantages. To ensure compliance with such policies, I also believe that district attorneys should establish training which focuses on their practical application. 
For example, training which aids in identifying and avoiding specific misconduct, in addition to training which aids in developing litigation skills. And I know that some offices already have such training uh, in place. And finally, I just uh, want to end by saying that prosecutors are entrusted with vast discretion. The decision whether, whom, and how to prosecute has life-altering consequences for the accused. The exercise of this discretion bears enormous responsibility. Because they have such immense power over people's lives, prosecutors are rightfully held to a higher standard of conduct than other lawyers, and they should be held to a higher standard of accountability as well. Thank you. John, we thought you could, having heard all of this, um, sort of reflect a little bit on what you've heard and sort of also what, tell us what you're hoping to get from these six conversations that we're having around the country. <clears throat> wow, that was deep. <laughs> I liked it. That. Um, <clears throat> what, what is the second panel in two days? So um, what, I'm, 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 what I'm keep hearing, and I'm, I'm, you know, this is really getting to egg me because we have different standards for people, and we keep using terms of uh, mistakes, abuse, ethnic violations. We're using everything to justify an act. And that act, if I do it, is called breaking the law. I'm, I'm, you know, I'm, just, I'm just trying to be the real. When you're looking at what is it, <laughs> and then we're going to have some set standards that say prosecutors is above the law, then we should deal with it. But we don't. And we're saying that they're not. Yet we justify the actions. We say, well, they have extreme amount of pressure put on them because they have to pursue these cases. They supposed to seek innocence, but they don't. If they don't seek innocence, what are we gonna do? We we not saying what we gonna do when they do cross that line. When we had that one road, we we could say if it's just one in out of a million. If we had that one individual that crossed that line, that want to commit a murder, that we can easily the prosecutor for me in particular, he puts eight of us on that row. Eight of us. <laughs> all of us is off that row. If all of us was executed, would he be considered a serial killer? <laughs> I'm asking a question. He he accused, he 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 premeditated the thought of seeking the death penalty. But you want you want to justify it and say, oh, it's an active violation. That was what no active violation. He tried to kill me. <laughs> we, we just need we need to wake up as a people and declare and decide what we want. But at the, at the same token, we got to understand that most of these guys work for us, you know. Um, and so they need to understand what we want as a people, not them sitting up here judging us, saying what is what is that was a crime, that was a crime, and they violated some men's. You know, we got three hundred and, and seventy something exonerees around the United States, and prosecutor being held accountable. The families that have been destroyed on both sides of the boat, the victim family and the people family that the folk accused. Where do, the, where, where, where do the justice come in at for me? Where do the justice come in for the man over there? Where do the justice come in at? You can't tell me you give him suspended a sentence five years and go back to practicing law three years from now or 10 years from now. That is not justice. You took 18 years of our lives. So what I'm asking and what we're hoping to get out of these meetings here is a better understanding on some real action, some real cause to move for action, not nobody sitting up here trying to just like really water down everything because that's all I've been hearing the last eight weeks, water down, everybody watering down. Nobody don't want to really call an ace or ace. And I don't know what it is. Even you know, judges themselves too. You know, some judges. I went in the court the other day and watched a police officer get caught in, in, in lies behind lies behind lies, police reports and all. Nothing happened. So at the very beginning of the system, where it just crumbled right in front of your face, we do nothing about it. But what's at stake? Freedom, liberty, everything that we claim we precious, we we cherish is at stake. But you want to classify? Uh, 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 water it down by saying, "Oh no, that just he just he just made a mistake. 
but that's a freedom that person lost their life. But that's all you look at it as, as a mistake when he do it. Not this thing that double standard need to go away. We need to hold. If, a, if these attorneys, if any one of them attorneys take $5 from the client too much, he could lose the job. But they could take our life on this side. Nothing happened. Today or tomorrow, if we wake up and hear Troy Davis was innocent, what are we going to do about it? If, if they wake up tomorrow and they say Troy, innocent, Troy Davis was innocent, we found exculpatory evidence that clearly, undoubtedly clear. Eight people came to the testimony in there. The prosecutor had to know something. What are we going to do? Just say that's all right? Or he just made a mistake? We got to make a decision on saying that we're going to have these guys that are going to cross that line. We can't do nothing about it. We're going to have the bad guys. What are we going to do with them when they do it? And let's deal with that. Let's stop playing and talk these games about these the watered-down charges we're trying. Them criminals. These should be handled as criminals. Stop. Let's, let's do away with the civil stuff. Let's, put it, let's get it serious. Let's get serious. Let's deal with crime. Okay. Thank you, John. I, I, would you like to respond, Judge? Yes. Yeah. Uh, it's a terrible tragedy, and of course we can't give Mr. Thompson back the time he lost. Uh, we all agree, I think everybody on the panel agrees, that people who commit crimes should be punished, go to jail. I do, I do that for a living, whether it's a cop or a judge. So the, somebody who does what was done to Mr. Thompson is a criminal. On the other hand, punishments have to fit the crime. And I get cases where there's thousands of pages of discovery. I try the case and there's a few pages missing. That doesn't, that doesn't deserve a firing or a jail sentence. I mean, uh, they're, all, they're all degrees of, of uh, misconduct. And the, the, the people who shouldn't be lawyers and are criminals should be punished. Those who commit uh, errors of carelessness or m minor things should be treated based upon what, what they have done. Do you, um, I guess, so for the most serious activities, let's say we can all agree that criminal sanctions may sometimes be appropriate. Yes. But we almost, almost never see it, including in John's case, and I would argue some like it. So what is it that prevents that from ever happening? And if we think it's sometimes appropriate, how would, what kind of system would we set up? How would we structure it so that actually criminal charges got brought? We have an attorney general's office uh, to prosecute an attorney. I mean, there's no reason why not. Uh, you know, uh, there are, we have uh, institutions in place. So one suggestion Our, is to have an attorney general's office have the capacity, have a unit, have a person or whatever who would, in addition to whatever, or just look at these allegations of serious misconduct and figure out if and when uh, right. criminal prosecution was appropriate. Yes. Are there, are there the other process. thoughts okay. about that? You can't, if you look at what happened in John's case, you have the very same prosecutor's office that nearly killed him being the office that was investigating their own lawyers. And so there was, you can't have that. And that's why the idea of an independent organism, an independent group like an attorney general or perhaps a special prosecutor ought to be mandated whenever there are serious allegations, and not just allegations, but let's say whatever standard we set, probable cause or whatever, that there was intentional mi misconduct. Because there, there was a grand jury, four of the lawyers who were still alive were brought before, before the grand jury and there was, shall we say, sufficient evidence to suggest that there ought to be criminal charges and in fact what happened was Harry Connick decided he was not going to prosecute them. So that, that can occur. If we're serious about a system where that kind of, mi of mi misconduct needs to be dealt with seriously and it should be, then you have to have an independent body. Just, just to echo that and taking Dewey's case as an example, the district attorney who was in office um, in 1990 during Dewey's retrial is still the district attorney today. He's basically the defendant in our civil lawsuit. Um, his in primary defense, despite um, a finding of um, that Dewey's constitutional rights were violated in, in the criminal case, is that Dewey's constitutional rights were not violated. There were no Brady violations in his case, and he, in fact, is guilty. Um, so the notion that um, a prosecutor is going to go after one of his assistant DAs um, on criminal charges, uh, you know, I think 
that's not going to happen. Um, you know, you see how they stick to, uh, I shouldn't generalize, but in, in this instance, you know, the district attorney is sticking to his story, sticking to what they did for so many decades, and I would imagine that that uh, is a more common phenomenon. Right, I think in John or Barry, you'll correct me, one of, if I get it wrong, but in your case, there was this, this they did investigate the possibility of, they called the grand jury, the grand jury, as Ellen said, uh, deci they decided they should bring, in fact, bring charges, the, the district attorney, uh, shut down the grand jury, and the only prosecutor who received any sort of discipline was not one of the trial prosecutors or one of the prosecutors on the case. <coughs> it was the person who had gotten the message from one of the trial prosecutors and then held on to that for a while before his colleague died, then brought the information forward about the withheld evidence, and he was prosecuted for um, obstruction of justice by delaying the testing. Is that not right, by Gary. Failure, he was, he was, but by failure to come forward. His name is Michael Reelman, and it, it's very interesting because he was the prosecutor who came forward after they discovered the existence of the blood swatch. His friend Deegan, who was the person with cancer and died, revealed to him, oh, by the way, I had suppressed it. And the bar went after Reelman. The, bar, the, the courtroom was packed with supporters of Reelman, prosecutors, defense lawyers, and others saying, do not go after him. You're sending the wrong message. If you go after Reelman, the message you're sending to other prosecutors is don't come forward with evidence that someone else has engaged in misconduct. But didn't he wait years before he He waited forward? five years, and that, that was the problem. Anything else, John, on that? To which I never thought happened. Uh -huh. <laughs> See, I don't think he confessed on no dying bed. That's just my opinion. Yeah. You know, I, I don't think that I don't think there's a question among anyone, among prosecutors in this audience, that conduct such as what occurred there is criminal. It's not, we can't use words like misconduct. It's criminal, and it should be prosecuted. I think what we're talking about, John, as well is so. What do we do with the broader issues? What do we do with issues that are not? So, so egregious, how are we going to have some ca accountability for those ca kinds of situations? Well, and I think, but I think, Ellen, the other question is when the conduct is that egregious, how do we, how can we be assured that the right office will investigate that and will make a decision about whether or not to pursue criminal uh, charges? Because, and I think the point of, it's very hard to ask the same office where the behavior occurred to make that finding, that's a lot to ask you know, I would guess of anybody. I don't know if, um, if for, for example, in any, for any of you who've been in prosecutors' offices, if there had been such egregious conduct in your office, would it have made, would your office have been able to do that prosecution? I think uh, so. The remedy would be to ask for a special prosecutor, in my opinion, to, to handle it. <laughs> the, the district attorney should ask, should ask, should, Right. Well, the, the well, administrative right. judge in the county should appoint a special prosecutor. And, and you don't ask an office to investigate itself, as I said before. Where do our United States Supreme, uh, United States Attorney General step in? Uh, the state attorney general. State, state attorney general is the top of uh, person, too. So I think you mentioned also the notion of um, mandated reporters. Yes. Um, the notion that DAs and judges should be mandated reporters. How do you... Uh, how do you think that system would work? What would you do to make that system work? I, I think at this point, the judges don't want to uh, report district attorneys to uh, bar associations. I mean, it's one thing to go to the, the uh, chief assistant and make a complaint and the, and the DA is fired. It's another thing to go to, go to a uh, bar association and the person loses their livelihood. It's a drastic remedy. If that was the law, I would abide by it. You know, if, they, if, they, if I was a mandated reporter, I would fulfill my obligations and, and report. 
if I may, I think that I think that Mandy's point is that it, in in these egregious cases that uh, an, an attorney should lose his license, lose his livelihood, at, at, and be disbarred. Um, and I think that that's I think that that's clear. Remember that it is the court who disbars lawyers. So these things have to come to the attention of the appropriate court through the uh, disciplinary or grievance committees. Any single, and any of these um, disbarments come from the court. I think that what one has to do is, and I think that, that mandatory reporting of truly egregious conduct is probably a good mechanism to get it at least there. But the, pro but the difficulty is, is of course defining the standards of what constitutes that kind of misconduct which should be mandatorily reported. And I think if, they, if, if one could come up with a, a set of standards that, that was practical and workable, then I think that mandatory reporting you know, it, is, is probably the best mechanism to bring to the attention of the court system via the grievance and disciplinary committees it's affecting licensure. Remember that that, that that only affects licensure. It does not deal with the criminal, uh, a criminal prosecution or a civil uh, suit. So in that sense, you know, um, the mandatory reporting that you're talking about would, would only affect licensure. And let me just say, in like in California, in New York, there is mandatory re re reporting mm -hmm. for certain kinds of conduct. Judges mm -hmm. are required to report, and it n almost never happens. When we had our Brady conference, we had judges talk about why they don't do it, and part of it is the piece of people they deal with every single day, they don't want them to lose their licenses, they don't want them to lose their livelihood. Um, and there's also a, a stigma, um, and in New York and a number of places, if a judge reports a prosecutor, they may get a call later on that day from the head of the prosecutor's office to their superior complaining that they have re reported one, one of the prosecutors in their office. So we have systems that do not encourage reporting, even if mandated. The same was true in California. Judges just don't, don't report lawyers. You know, no defense lawyers report either. Some years ago, there was the creation of what was called the Prosecutorial and Judicial Complaint Center. And the idea there was defense lawyers <coughs> are fearful of reporting a prosecutor because they feel in the next case their client will, will suffer. Generally speaking, defense lawyers don't want to report prosecutors anyway. They think about their client. They think about their case. They may complain about Brady violations, but they're not about to report for that prosecutor. Um, so we created this commission thinking, okay, people will use it. They will come forward. This commission's role was to vet the individual case to see if, in fact, it constituted misconduct, and almost nobody uses it. It's just, it, it, it's a culture. Um, where the whole system of discipline is really not used. I don't know about what, what Sarah Joe's you know talking about in terms of okay. the disciplinary process because we just don't know. All we know are those very few cases that are in the law journal, but from the information that's been uncovered through civil law lawsuits, there are numbers of cases where prosecutors have engaged in egregious m misconduct and nothing has happened and their offices have supported them. So those are cases from the 80s and 90s. Maybe things are different now. I don't really know. I think you're right, Ellen, in the fact that, that there is a reluctance to report on the, on the part of personnel. But one of the reasons for that, and this is just my opinion, is that the uh, standard of, of, you know, when, when, uh, when someone, a lawyer or a judge, knows that another attorney has engaged in misconduct, a violation of the rules, and the standard of knowledge is actual knowledge, and it's it's it it is more difficult to report under that kind of mandatory reporting system than it would be to say if you have a specific instance where a prosecutor has engaged in intentional um, violation of of the mandated you know legal and ethical precepts you know governing criminal prosecutions, and and outlined. You know, specifically, some specific examples, as his honor just did in his in his uh, presentation. Then I think it's easier to. It, it may be. I shouldn't say it will be, but it may be easier for others to report because that specific language that says, you know, this is a violation and this must be reported, and uh, instead of resorting to reporting under a more general a more general requirement.
I, I think the professor made some very insightful uh, observations mm -hmm. about what, what goes on in the real world. And I think there's a need for education uh, for judges to know their responsibilities. One of the recommendations that we've heard was this man mandatory reporting, but really mandatory reporting, even kind of almost a clerical reporting of every finding by a court during a trial or a hearing of misconduct or error by the prosecutor, not necessarily to go to the state disciplinary authority, but really to keep a record of every error and at least turn that information over to the district attorney's office or to some third party for kind of a review of the types of errors so that appropriate courses of action could be taken with appropriate kind of uh, behaviors and that there'd be then a record of what was going on. Uh, right now it seems it's in very isolated courtrooms, different people know different things and there isn't a kind of whole system look at the kinds of errors that are, that are uh, you know, happening every day or happening however often they happen. What about the sort of a clerical, just a keeping record of the findings of, of error misconduct? By whom? Um, who would keep such a record? I mean, you'd have to have a record keeper, and that person would have to be able to see and to record every error that occurred in, in, in a DA's office or in a particular uh, judicial department. I'm not sure that, that, that that's a practical approach. I think that perhaps, um, you know, uh, I, I just, I don't, I don't see how, how a record keeping requirement can be managed. If it could be, you know, that, that would be something else. Maybe a clerk, a clerk of the court, a court clerk with a judge making a note to just make a record. I mean, it's, you're talking about something that's potentially voluminous. Like, yeah. uh, okay, um, that prosecutor asked three leading questions in a row. That's error. Let's document that. I don't know what, I mean, I don't know that it's useful to record to that extent. If you're talking about some finding of egregious misconduct or a violation of an ethical rule, sure. I think violations Reported, of an ethical rule, we but, can take it to there. But when you're there. talking about error, that's just such a broad concept. Uh, I guess I, I would, meant er error in the, in the ethical rule context. I would think that the prosecutor's offices that are engaged in all the training and they're doing a great job would want to know what goes on in the courtroom. They'd want to know do their lawyers actually fail to correct testimony that a judge said you should have corrected that? Have their lawyers been found on the record not to turn over evidence when they were supposed to turn it over? Have they made false statements to a court? If you're doing good training within an office, you need to have that data so that you can come back and hopefully have a mechanism whereby you sit down, not just that with, with that individual, but actually, I would hope that they would be able to sit down and when, when time permits, I understand. You know, I'm not just a professor, actually. I understand there is a real-world consequence in terms of time. But there need to be ways in which prosecutors look at what we call near misses. There, there really was almost a terrible error, and here's why. And it may be because Prosecutor X in five different courtrooms on five different days made false statements of fact. I would want to know that. And I would hope that those offices move in the direction of trying to ensure that courts have that data. I mean, one of the problems with our system is we're not in the 21st century. I have to say, I go elsewhere. People have computerized systems. You know, the police computerize everything. They send everything over to the prosecutor by, in real time by a computer. And then a lot of that goes to the defense immediately. And we don't operate that way. And until I think we get good systems in place, it will seem daunting to a judge, of course, sitting there to think, who's going to write this down? How are we going to do this? And when you say we, you mean New York? I mean New York. Yeah. I mean, I, the, I know we think we're the center of the universe, you know, and we are in many ways. The giants are great and all that's terrific. But, you know, we, I, I look at Portland, I look at Seattle, I look at Milwaukee, I look at other systems around the country where they actually have workable computer systems. And in real, if think about civil discovery, for instance. You know, now we spend a lot of time in civil discovery talking about ESI, electronically stored information. You know, it's going to be another 20 years, I fear, before that concept actually reaches the criminal ju justice system in state courts the way the way, way that it should. And I think it's time to move forward. Okay. In about 10 minutes, we're going to take questions from the audience. So if you have them and haven't had a chance to pass them in. Uh, please do that, and some Innocence Project staff will be 
collecting them and bringing them up. Uh, Another uh, question for the, for the yeah. panel. One of the things I've been thinking about is the fact that our disciplinary systems are really not set up to deal with these things. Our disciplinary systems in most jurisdictions are there for lawyers who steal clients' money, lawyers not returning telephone calls, some conflicts of interest. And in fact, when you file a complaint with disciplinary committees, not in New York, but elsewhere, they ask you, what's the name of your client, right? So it, it's not even in the form set up such that it looks at prosecutors and defenders. I've often thought that what we need is an independent commission that, that, would, be, that would look at both prosecution and defense conduct, similar to the way we have commissions on judicial conduct. Now, I know you're going to tell me it's unrealistic because there's no money in the system for anything. Um, and that you know it probably won't, won't work. But I always like to start with what I think is best and then work back backwards from there. So I'm curious actually as to what the rest of the panelists think about that. That and or making sure that the people who are on disciplinary committees have extensive experience with both prosecution and defense. You cannot have people with limited experience be charged with the responsibility of examining conduct. I, I would be fearful if I were a prosecutor being brought before a commission or a committee, a disciplinary committee, that really didn't know how to try a case. I think your observation is well-founded in, in many respects. I think that if you, that it, it, isn't, it isn't for lack of, you know, resources. That, that's not the answer. I think specifically, Ellen, that, the, that disciplinary committees and grievance committees are creatures of the court. They are arms of the court. And if you, if a court were to set up a special, because all of these, all of the, these New York criminal cases eventually come to the same appellate courts that uh, respondent, you know, discipline comes to. If it were, if the courts were to set up a special, you know, um, disciplinary office involving simply criminal, you know, both defense, both complaints against defense attorneys and prosecutors, that's probably, you know, uh, that's probably, that would be more effective. I agree with you. That would be much more effective than the way it's done now. Um, but I'm not sure how you would get the court to do that. Uh, in addition to the attorney general model or maybe the special commission, people have thought about, maybe it's similar to attorney general, an inspector general. We have one in New York State that can look at lots of different um, activities of government actors in the state. Would a special part of an inspector general's office to look at these issues be helpful? And I think some of the things that are, uh, are uh, thought about that office is that they have the power not only to investigate the the instant case, but to the extent that it appears that what's going on is a pattern or is a result of training, they have the ability to do a sort of f further investigation or audit and really kind of get to the root, if you will, of problems if there's something more than just the person there. Are there thoughts from any of you on the Inspector General model? This, this is a uh, double-edged sword. Uh, if it works, it's very good. We have a, a historical blueprint I don't know if you remember Najari. I mean, I'm yes, I'm your case. Dating yes. myself. They, the special prosecutor was more abusive than any of the district attorney's offices, and he did terrible things. So I mean, it, you know, he, if it's done well, yes, but this is another area where we can have abuses. Yeah, I, I think it really depends. Every jurisdiction might adopt a different kind of a model. In some places, an inspector general model may work. In other places, an independent commission may work. But I do think that you have to have some sense of independence and some power not only to investigate misconduct, but, Maddie, as you suggest, similar to the model, say, in North Carolina or perhaps akin to some of the conviction integrity units that have been set up, what we would like to see happen is for them to not just look at the conduct but look at the underlying reasons and see what kind of corrective action systemically could be re recommended. We, have a, we had a task force on wrongful convictions in New York. That commission did terrific work and I, would I, I could see how you'd have a commission on prosecutorial and defense conduct that would include something like the task force on wrongful convictions. So it would be a lot broader than just looking at misconduct. Mm -hmm. Okay, I think uh, we're gonna take questions now from the audience. Actually, one more, just because I don't know that it's in there and I haven't been able to read them, which is this question of public information or accountability. How can we, how can the public know, should the public be able to know 
what goes on in the disciplinary committees to the extent we're criminally prosecuting people, what goes on uh, in the criminal prosecutions, and to the extent that work is being done uh, in individual district attorney's offices, is there some kind of information that, that could be given to the public, not a report of names perhaps, but a report at least of actions taken so that the public has a sense that these issues are being taken seriously in, by the institutions that handle them. Um, on the disciplinary committee, do you have a, a Sarah Jo, do you have a thought about pu public reporting? Well, uh, I've, th that's been uh, a, an issue hotly debated, you know, for, for many years now, is, is whether the whether New York should open up the disciplinary system. Um, right now, there are no statistics that are kept uh, with respect to defense attorneys, prosecutors, or any other kind of lawyer. It's just not kept in any in any form. Perhaps if one were if if the statistics were mandated to be kept in in that, and again, that would have to be a mandate of the court or the, or the disciplinary committees would have to be persuaded. But remember, these statistics belong to the court. So it, ultimately, almost anything that comes out of a grievance or disciplinary committee has to be approved by the by the appellate division uh, to to which that committee belongs. But I think you could get statistics. I, I think that that would not be difficult to do or to implement. Whether you could open up the system and, and reveal, you know, specific um, specific violations, um, I doubt it. Private discipline is dearly held in New York, and it's been it's it, it's you know been <laughs> um, and and for those of us who do you know uh, disciplinary defense work, it's it's it, we see the good <coughs> attached in many cases to to private discipline. So I don't think you're going to get public discipline or public acknowledgement of what prosecutors did did uh, for the you know minor, if you want to call it that, uh, uh, committed minor violations, as opposed to the egregious intentional withholding of, of evidence or something like that. Let me just say I've tried to get this data both in New York and around the country. There's something called the National Organization of Bar Council, and for the last few years we've been trying to encourage them to provide us with data. And there are some jurisdictions that would willingly do it. Um, they're not in New York. The organizations, organization as a whole will not. Uh, Sarah Jo points out it's really seriously guarded in information. Um, there's a statute in New York that would need to be changed in order to gather information. I don't read it the way that the disciplinary committees read it. It's section 9010 if you want to look at it. But they read it to say, it says everything's private and secret and confidential, all the hearings. They read it to say that also covers data. Um, so there would have to be, I think, a proposal to change 9010 in order to open up the process. And I'm, you know, she knows very well, more than I do, uh, that's unlikely to happen in New York. In other jurisdictions, hearings are opened up after there's a probable cause finding. And they have people on the panels consisting of half lay people and half lawyers. That's not our model. And we jealously guard our secrecy model here in New York. So um, stay tuned for any changes in that in New York. I don't think it's happening anytime soon. Okay, I'm gonna go to the questions from the audience. And um, Lauren Kessler, who's an Innocence Project student, one of the fixes the Brooklyn DA said they've established is an internal review board. But as Judge Condorman said, the prosecutor who did the misconduct will often be the only person who knows of it. How can these review boards catch and counteract this? That's what it's intended to do. It's not to say, oh, I've committed a violation, mea culpa, let me tell you about it, right? Um, and hopefully, look, we have to trust internal systems. I mean, that's primarily how change is going to occur. Uh, training is essential. It's, it's essential, it's not sufficient, right? But you have to rely upon whatever internal mechanisms are set up within the prosecutor's office to ensure that at least most of, the, most of those violations will, will be dealt with um, in, a, in a relatively decent way. Okay. Um, how can we suggest that existing institutions are adequate for handling misconduct that so disproportionately burdens those of us who are unrepresented in the system of legal checks? And the other part of that question was the composition of tonight's panel raises the question of what role will the voices of underrepresented minorities have and how will they be brought into this conversation when they are disproportionately affected 
especially by the decisions made and actions taken by Adam and, and at NYU Law. I have to stop just talking. Go ahead, someone wants to start? Well, I, I think there's certainly a, an effort to have uh, uh, more judges of color and have a more diverse, from my point of view of the judiciary, a more diverse judiciary and an effort made uh, in that respect. Look, I think uh, this system is, is a broken system, right? And so we have intractable problems. We have intractable problems of poverty and race, as everybody he here knows. And we're not going to be able to solve those problems by looking at this mi minor piece, I think, after, after conviction is what should we do about X, Y, Y, Z. Um, what, we can, what we can hope on the front end, at least, is to come up with a series of reforms both internally within offices, where there's much more hiring, hopefully, of a diverse segment of the population, where there are better systems in place, where we have discovery reform, where we have a whole host of issues um, that, that we put on the table and change. And I, I think you know, there's no panacea for this. It's, it's, it's an intractable problem at the moment. I think we should look to uh, the uh, pri private industry. If you work in, in, a, in a firm and you screw things up, you're going to hear about it. Your boss is going to come down on you. You get fired. And in the public sector, everything, a lot of things just seem to go by the boards. I don't think we follow the, the, the model of the private sector. John, do you have a thought? Mm, no? No. <laughs> okay. Uh, in New York State, our governor can exercise Article 4, Section 3 of the New York State Constitution using Executive Law, Section 63.3, written by a lawyer or not, uh, which empowers him to remove a county DA and appoint a special prosecutor, an extraordinary grand jury from another region of uh, New York State. However, a concerted effort by concerned citizens of Suffolk County over the past 10 months has not been successful. Any advice or ideas would be most welcome. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> to be continued. Is yes. I, I, okay, I, I really don't know enough about the background mm -hmm. to, to, to yeah. make an, a comment. I don't know what basically. Maybe. Anywhere in New York State, in any of the, our 62 counties, uh, Cuomo ever used the executive power to remove a county DA and appoint a Okay, I think, so maybe people can talk to you later. We can figure out if uh, there's anyone who can help answer that question. But it doesn't appear that the panel knows it uh, right This now. came up, not recently, but a number of years ago when, when uh, I think the, the DA in the Bronx didn't want to have uh, mm -hmm. uh, death penalty death prosecutions. Penalty. Mm -hmm. And the, yeah. the, the right. governor was pro-death penalty and was looking to, I'm not sure what happened, I don't remember anymore, but uh, that was an instance where they, he wanted They removed to, Rob Johnson and from replaced a case, somebody else, right. Mm -hmm. The other, the other case is the Howard Beach case where uh, uh, John Santucci was uh, replaced by uh, Joe Hines. Uh, this is a question from Arthur Larkin at the New York City Law Department. Do you think an open file policy or expanded pretrial discovery rights for criminal defendants would assist in addressing some of these issues? Without a doubt. And I, let me just talk about that for a minute. I told you in the beginning that we had a conference here two years ago where we brought together members of the medical profession, social psychologists, organizational psychologists, lawyers, judges, et cetera, et cetera, to talk about what would work to improve our, our disclosure practices. Um, and you, you can read about that if you like. It's published in Cardozo Law, Law Review. There are many articles. Um, and one of the things we learned through that process and subsequently is that in jurisdictions where there is codified open file discovery, which is to say there's a statute that, that tells prosecutors what they must disclose, not generic open file discovery. Like I know somebody from Alabama who says, here's what you get. Here's my file. You have everything in it. And there's nothing in it, right? So you can't have that form of open file discovery. But if you had codified open file discovery, what we know from various jurisdictions. North Carolina has a statute. Ohio ha has a statute. Jurisdictions like Portland, Milwaukee, Seattle, a variety of other jurisdictions have actual open file, file discovery. The prosecution's fears that exist here and exist elsewhere, that witnesses will, will be harmed, that they'd have to reveal their names of confidential informants, that, those are dealt with. They don't have to do that. There are ways in which you can get protective orders from a court so that you don't have to worry about witnesses being killed. Um, but at the same time, defense lawyers need to have the information to try, try their cases. 
Brooklyn has a variety of open file discovery except in very serious cases which create difficulties for people trying homicide or sex crimes cases because it's a little bit of a cat and mouse game. But what we've learned from other jurisdictions is that where those, file, where those open file discovery systems exist and they work by statute, the defendants trust their lawyers more because the lawyers come to them and say, oh, look at the information they have against you, right? And so the defense defendant sees what the information is. The pleas are faster um, and they're more, more informed. Prosecutors and defenders get along better. There are the same number of trials. And in Ohio, I heard recently that there are fewer trials because one of the things defense lawyers in this audience will not like in this, those jurisdictions, they have reciprocal discovery as well by statute. And defense lawyers are required to turn over to the prosecutors impeachment ev evidence of some of their witnesses. And at least in, uh, this is anecdotal, in some cases in Ohio, that, that resulted in better pleas and fewer trials because the prosecutors saw the difficulties in their cases. I, I know that's not going to be a popular suggestion in this audience for, for the defense lawyers who are there. But in any event, the systems that have it work much more effectively. And I, I think we have to move in that direction in, in New York. It will stop a lot of the cat and mouse games. It will cost a lot less money. There won't be as many discovery motions. Perhaps there, there will be fewer um, c civil cases. I just think overall, as we look at these systemically, it's a much better idea. And then my question would be, as a follow-up to that, which I didn't get an answer to, what can I follow and ask this question about compliance conferences? So if we had a system, either open file discovery or akin to more discovery, what do you think about the idea of judicial compliance conferences? My sense is that if someone has to go to court and say, judge, this is what I turned over, um, people would look much more carefully at, at their files. Right. Be, be, before you made a statement to a court that you turned, you looked at everything, you talked to the police agencies, I, I think it might improve the system. So I'm curious as to what you think. Well, I have 230 cases in my, uh, I'm carrying in my inventory. Uh, some of the cases, the uh, discovery would fill this room. So uh, it sounds very good and, you know, theoretically, how anybody could manage it, I don't, it would be, uh, I'm not so sure. Well, I don't have Judge Boto's experience on this issue, and I do agree that in theory, it's an excellent idea. You had mentioned pre-plea and pre-trial. I think pre-plea might be a little difficult, and if a person is willing to take a guilty plea, I have to hope that that means that he actually did it, and that there's less of these actual innocence uh, issues that are presenting themselves and maybe less of a need for that sort of exchange of, of information if a reasonable plea offer is being made and it's being accepted by a defendant. But I think certainly pre-trial that it's a great idea and if there was some way that it could be effectively incorporated and carried out, I think that would help a lot with these issues. So, just as, just as a point of fact, I'll say, and it's true that most of the cases are resolved by a plea. There are just, for whatever it's worth, 20, at least 20 DNA exonerations of people who <sighs> pled guilty. Right. So um, we, we just, we always remember that and maybe throws a wrench in that system a little yeah, bit. Being guilty who are not guilty, that's an endemic in the system. They don't want to take the risk of a trial. So you see that, you know, unfortunately. Also, just one more note on open file policies and I certainly have far less experience than anyone else on this panel, or I'll speak for me and Shauna, we have far less experience. But, uh, you know, from what we've read um, um, from experts in the field, um, um, you know, people sometimes get a little too much security behind open file policies. An office says we have an open file policy or an ADA says I showed you everything. Um, but did they actually show you everything? Um, the defense lawyer might be inclined to not look further if the DA or ADA is making representations and giving you everything that could possibly be important to this case. Um, you know, in Dewey's case, we have an example where some information was turned over to him. It just wasn't the information that directly contradicted the, te the testimony of the two convicted felons. It was testimony that made people seem completely <coughs> irrelevant to the case at all. Um, so, you know, I think an open file policy is definitely a step in the right direction or requiring, you know, 
disclosure of what it is that, you know, to the court that you're actually disclosing. But, um, you know, it's not, it's not going to get us all there all the way there are still inherent problems in that system. Well, there are, but there's a, I have a thought on that, which is that attorneys are required to affirm that they have a reasonable basis to file a document in court in civil law. And every single filing, if it's a motion, if it's a complaint, has to be affirmed uh, that there's a reasonable basis for it. And if that same affirmation were required, either in open file discovery or in compliance conference by the attorneys who were participating, um, that might be, it might be, I don't know, it, it, a more serious, I mean, you're affirming, and, and that's under penalty of perjury. So, um, you know, that, that's a possibility. It's routinely affirmed in civil practice, routinely. Granted, the the um, sanctions may not be as severe, but they can be very severe, and uh, monetarily and and civilly. So, you know, there there are ways if one wanted to carve out a a way to do it that it could be done, and it would, you know, if if you're not going to affirm that you've done this, then you better think. And I know at least one office in the country is considering an internal disclosure affidavit where during a conference they're going to require that the lawyer sit down with the supervisor and sign off on an affidavit as to specified categories of, of activity that, that they've just undertaken. They've reviewed the police files, they've reviewed every police file, et cetera, et cetera. So that, that's yet another idea. I just wanted to comment, the point you raise is key, which is to say we tend to, when we talk about prosecutorial misconduct and misconduct, we tend to forget the interplay between prosecutorial misconduct and ineffective assistance of counsel. As mm -hmm. Maddie said in the beginning, the wrongful conviction cases typically have both misconduct and lawyers who didn't do very much. And so the idea of having open file discovery with a lawyer just <coughs> taking that and going, oh, great, I have everything, um, is not exactly the way that we expect the defense bar to function. This is not the topic of this panel, but I think that we need to certify pr criminal lawyers so that they become criminal trial specialists. But that's for another day. Hmm. <laughs>